Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the new Sounds True Foundation. The Sounds True Foundation is dedicated to creating a wiser and kinder world by making transformational education widely available. We want everyone to have access to transformational tools such as mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion, regardless of financial, social, or physical challenges. The Sounds True Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to providing these transformational tools to communities in need, including at-risk youth, prisoners, veterans, and those in developing countries. If you'd like to learn more or feel inspired to become a supporter, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. You're listening to Insights at the Edge. Today, my guest is Rachel Ricketts. Rachel is a racial justice educator, an attorney, a change maker, a healer, and an author. She hosts online and in-person workshops, including her spiritual activism series, which promotes racial justice, reconciliation, and healing. She's the author of the new book, Do Better, Spiritual Activism for Fighting and Healing from White Supremacy. Rachel raises our awareness that we live immersed in a collective matrix of white supremacy, where white people have the most power and privilege by the nature of being white. And she introduces us to the daily work and the lifetime work we can each do, both inner and outer work, to unplug from that matrix, which is so harmful. Here's a very provocative and eye-opening conversation with Rachel Ricketts. To begin, Rachel, I just want to thank you for making the time for this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And I wanted to start by talking about spiritual activism, this intersection between our spiritual journey and our journey as activists. And I know that you teach spiritual activism workshops, and I'd love to know what that term means to you. What does it mean to Rachel Ricketts for people to be spiritual activists? Mm, yeah, that's a... Um... A great first question. Thank you. So um, to me, spiritual activism is um, daily, active, ongoing, anti-oppressive thought, speech, and actions that are informed um, often by a connection with something bigger than us. So um, a spiritual power, whether that's secular or non-secular, um, and frequently embodied <clears throat> and supported by culturally informed spiritual practices such as meditation, breathwork, Reiki, and yoga. Um, I don't believe that you can be a spiritual person without being an activist because if you're a spiritual person, you understand the deep uh, interconnectedness of all of us beings here on earth. You understand that your oppression is my oppression, although uh, depending on the power and privilege that you possess based on your human identity. Um, we do not experience our human experiences the same. Um, but to be spiritual to me is to be an activist. It is to be actively partaking in the work required to create liberty um, and equality for all. And I think uh, being an activist is um, only bolstered by a connection to spirit, by something deeper within us um, and uh, above us. Um, because I think when we partake in activism in a way that isn't honoring and prioritizing our interconnectedness, um, then we can actually just create more harm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanted to ask you a couple further questions. You mentioned culturally informed spiritual practices. You know, this is something that's been on my heart for a long time at Sounds True, as someone who was introduced to meditation through Indian and Tibetan spiritual traditions. 
and recently have heard people talk about their yoga practice or their meditation practice and saying, you know, oh, that's a form of cultural appropriation if you're practicing yoga or you're practicing meditation. And I noticed in your book, Do Better, you offer certain yoga practices, yoga breathing, and some meditation practices, but you frame them in a very specific way by thanking and noting the traditions where they come from. And I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that for people who are drawn to these kinds of practices. How do we make sure that we're not engaging in cultural appropriation? I think what's really important is first and foremost for folks to have an understanding of um, the cultures of origin of the practice that they're partaking in, and not only the cultures of origin, but the real um, intention and root, the um, circumstances as well under which some of these practices were cultivated and created, um, as well as an acknowledgement, an embodiment, um, um, and an appreciation for the ways in which um, your ancestry and ancestors um, exchanged and interacted with the uh, specific cultures and communities from which the practices you seek to partake in um, originated. So a case in point, let's talk about yoga. Um, ancient Indian practice, um, also Kemetic practice, Northern Africa. Um, so white folks who are partaking in yoga, it is important to have an understanding of the ways in which your ancestors um, interacted with the practice and with um, folks from India and from North Africa. So yoga was uh, a practice that was um, banned. It wasn't allowed to be uh, practice in India under British colonial rule because it was a practice that um, fostered, as I spoke to in a moment ago about spiritual activism, it, it fostered connection and resilience um, and that could result in uh, rebellion um, and, and healing. And if you're trying to control people, you certainly don't want them healed. So that acknowledgement, that awareness is, is vital. You're practicing something that um, was uh, banned the, from the cultures and um, communities that originated this practice. Also, a lot of the practices that folks partake in today are practices that were created by and for communities of color. Um, and a lot of them were uh, born from a need for deep resilience uh, as a result of ongoing discrimination and oppression by those who have the most power and privilege. Um, so there's lots more I could say, there's lots of elements involved, but a real acknowledgement and acceptance and explicit um, understanding and embodiment of the roots and origins of the practice and the ways in which uh, you and your ancestors have interacted with that practice and with the communities who, who cultivated and created it. Mm -hmm. How do you see people going about meditation or yoga in ways that you think is contributing to the problem, the problems that we have, the problems of being part of a white supremacist culture? Um, one is definitely to... Um, appropriate the practice, so re to remove the practice from um, its original embodiment or, or to partake in a practice that isn't um, what the practice was intended to be. So uh, I'll go back to yoga. There are some practices out there that call themselves, uh, that are called yoga, um, that were created predominantly by white folks for white folks. Um, and they're stripped of all cultural relevance. And in fact, not really yoga at all. Um, there, it's physical movement and it can be healing and helpful for sure, um, but let's not call it yoga if that's not what it is. Um, so that is something that is uh, deeply harmful. I also think um, specifically when people who have the most power and privilege are partaking in spiritual practices um, for their benefit, specifically like financial benefit, you make a living off of whatever the said practice is, if you are not redistributing funds, right? It's an energetic exchange. If you're not redistributing funds um, to the communities and cultures that created that practice, then uh, that's harmful. That's utilizing your power and privilege um, in a means that is extractive and exploitative. 
Mm -hmm. You know, Rachel, right here at the beginning, I'd love our Insights at the Edge listeners to get to know you a little bit more. There's so much in your book, Do Better, Spiritual Activism for Fighting and Healing White Supremacy. There are so many important ideas in the book. And I'm tempted to just go into the ideas that captivated me. But I want our listeners to get a sense of who you are and where you're coming from. And this is a little bit of a very open-ended question. But if you were to share kind of your personal story that brought you to this moment in time, this moment in time is the author of the book, Do Better. Give us a sense of the background that brought you here. Sure. Where do I begin? <laughs> um, I always say that this work began before I exited the womb, right? This work began with my ancestors. So um, this work is um, a, a product of uh, all of the work and experiences that my ancestors um, endured. I believe that our ancestors walk into every room and engage in every conversation that we have, whether we're aware of it or not. And people who have the most power and privilege most often are not aware of that. Um, and so it's a deep honor. It's a deep, deep, deep honor to be able to continue uh, the work and legacy that my ancestors started. I was raised, um, I'm a queer, black, multiracial woman, and I was raised <clears throat> in a predominantly white and wealthy area, community. Um, so I was constantly ostracized and oppressed and othered. Not only was I um, the only black person for miles, I was often the only uh, black indigenous or person of color um, in my elementary school, in my high school, I mean, really even in my university. Um, and so as a result, the impact of that from very young, I talk about this in the book, there's, there's memories I have from as young as five where I knew I was being treated differently. I mean, my kindergarten teacher, teacher who was white tried to hold me back a year because the school board manual said that my brain was smaller than my white classmates' brains. And I didn't speak up in class because energetically I could sense she was um, racist. And um, so she just assumed I was dumb and she tried to hold me back a year. And if not for the firecracker that was my mother, um, that would have been my start to schooling, right? Being labeled dumb and being held back here for no reason other than being black. And, um, you know, my, my childhood, my early adolescence is, is rife with stories like these. Um, and I'm not alone. This is not exceptional. This is unfortunately very much the status quo. And I get into the statistics around that in my book. Um, and so I had a lot of traumatic experiences as a result of being um, oppressed and discriminated solely because of my race and gender identity, being a black woman identified person. Um, I didn't even realize I was queer until a few years ago um, because of so much internalized oppression in our heteronormative society. Um, but certainly faced oppression as a result of being queer, you know, oppressing myself, um, not wanting to be othered or ostracized any more than I already was. Um, in my life. So I had a deep, deep, deep um, experience, not only in my own body, but my mother being a single mother, um, a multiracial black woman uh, who had a chronic illness, she had MS. And I talk about this at length in my book, supporting her through that experience, um, coming up against uh, the medical systems, social welfare systems, housing systems, et cetera, that are all rife with white supremacy. So uh, making a challenging situation all the more challenging. So we never received the support um, that we deserved. <clears throat> and I'm saying that from a, a place of deep privilege because um, I was born and raised in Canada. So we have um, quite wonderful social welfare and healthcare systems, you know, specific, very uh, particularly in contrast to the United States, but um, around the world. And yet, uh, we were still very much um, discriminated against as a result of race and gender identity. So um, all of these things really informing my own personal experience. Of course, I experienced all of these harms in my professional settings as well. I was a corporate attorney for many years um, and always had a deep sense of justice, which is why I went to law school, very quickly learned that law has nothing to do with justice, which was <laughs> deeply heartbreaking. Um, to learn and then um, left law, realized just absolutely not my soul's calling um, and got very tired of enduring daily, daily uh, racial uh, misogynist aggressions, violence in the workplace. Um, and I left law 
And um, a year later, uh, two years later, <clears throat> my mother um, decided to transition. She, at that point, uh, was only able to like blink her eyelids and move her neck side to side somewhat and was in writhing pain all the time. Um, and uh, wanted to make the choice to die with dignity while she was still able to. And so I supported her in that transition over the course of many months. And again, we continued to combat systems of oppression through that um, endeavor and desire to support her in um, dying with dignity, which includes dying painlessly. Um, she had to starve and dehydrate herself to death in order to achieve the the peace she so desperately deserved. And I supported her with that every step of the way. And it was after the physical loss of my mother that the weight of all of this really um, came down on me really all at once because I had been in, you know, fight, flight, freeze, fawn my whole life. Um, I'd been caring from, for her since I was 13, only child of a single parent. Um, and when I lost her physically, I of course grieved the physical loss of my mom, but being a spiritual person felt very strongly. She was still very much around. Um, but I lost, I was grieving all of the losses that had occurred along the way. Um, you know, switching the roles of being a parent and child, like quite young, needing to be her caretaker early on, having to constantly lawyer up to, to fight for her, to have some semblance of dig dignity um, and care for herself and for me. Um, in addition to navigating my own shit, you know, moving through the world <clears throat> as a black multiracial woman, specifically in white and wealthy spaces. Um, and so that uh, was really the, um, the major shift for me. I was always very much involved in racial justice and justice. Um, but after leaving the practice of law and after the lo physical loss of my mom, I dove deep into grief work. Um, and for me, racial justice work is grief work, it's healing work, it's trauma work, it's shadow work. Um, I dove deep into grief work because I realized how ill-equipped we are as a society to deal with grief. I think uh, the global health pandemic we're in has really um, brought that home for a lot of folks, that grief manifests in many, 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 many ways, and that most of us are ill-equipped to really deal with that um, or even acknowledge it as grief. And then I very promptly uh, realized that the most grief I've ever endured in my entire life is a result of um, white supremacy. It's a result of having to navigate white supremacist systems as a queer, black, multiracial, woman-identified person. And so um, I, I quickly got into or got back into um, more active work around racial justice and fusing my lifelong spiritual practice um, both my parents were very sp spiritual people, um, and fusing that work with um, with justice, with racial justice, because it was work that I wasn't seeing out in the world. It was work that I felt was really needed, and mostly it's because the spiritual work that I had done, the healing work I had done through um, culturally informed secular spirituality, is what got me through. <laughs> it's what allowed me allowed me to survive um, all of the things that I've survived, and it's a lot. So I just felt like this is the work that can really support um, all of us as a collective in moving forward. It's also work I feel like is very, very important as someone who was raised in a white and wealthy society, who most of my friends and people I call, called family, um, people I spent you know, many, if not most Christmas Eves with, like we were tight, were folks who have a lot of power and privilege who refused to acknowledge or address it in any way, shape or form, who loved me and caused me a lot of harm. And a lot of that I believed was as a result of not being able to do their own shadow work, their own healing work to embody um, themselves. And thus they had no capacity to be able to show up, um, let alone have compassion or empathy or create change for those who are most marginalized and very specifically those who they um, have harmed. So uh, having that experience was absolutely vital. Um, not only <laughs> the brunt of it, like enduring all of that trauma, but also um, being intimately connected with whiteness um, in a way that for me very much showed that this is healing work and the extent to which people who hold the most power and privilege, the extent to which people who operate um, and identify uh, as 
holding oppressed ide- identity, dominant identities, the extent to which they are unable, unwilling, ill-equipped to do their inner healing work is the extent to which we will never be able to create justice on this planet. Um, and that is that is why I do the work that I do um, to support collective liberation for everyone. You know, Rachel, you said something uh, that really got my attention. You said that when each one of us walks into a room, our ancestors walk into the room with us, whether we're aware of that or not. And you shared a little bit about your mother and father both being very spiritual people. And you told us a little bit about your mom and her transition process. But I'm curious, when your ancestors walk in the room with you, mm-hmm. how do you feel that? Like, what is it? What do you sense? What is? What do you know in that moment when you tune into that? Mm. Um, I've been tuning into it so much more lately and part part of writing this book was tuning into them like I I was a conduit Um, a lot of what's in the book is my experience but all of my experiences are informed by my ancestors which is very specifically what I mean when I say when we walk into a room our ancestors walk with us Um, and as someone who is an and my ancestors were enslaved Um, and I can never forget that (laughs) it is um, it has consequences uh, has had consequences down my entire familial line and continues to have consequences for me and all of my future ancestors. And um, that is true for all of us, including white people. But when you have the most power privilege, it's easy to not understand that, like the, the benefit of of not being enslaved, <laughs> the benefit of not having had all of your land stolen from you um, by uh, your ancestors and the benefit, you know, the wealth privilege that you get to accumulate over centuries as a result of those uh, practices and choices. Um, so my, I say this a lot in my work, I'm not saying anything new and I don't believe that any racial justice activist is. We have been saying the same thing for hundreds of years. And that's really hard for our human minds to be with, um, especially if we occupy dominant identities. Hundreds of years, we have been saying the same thing. And yes, we've come we've come far in a lot of ways and we haven't. Um, Things are very much the same in a lot of other ways. And so I think it's really important for us to tap into our ancestors and our ancestry um, so that we can build upon, have a a fulsome acknowledgement of what happened, of what our history is, not the history out there, not the history of the people over in the corner, but our ancestry, our history and the the collective impact of that. and to tune in to the ways in which we have benefited from and or been harmed by the ancestry, um, the impact of, of, of um, what occurred to our ancestors and or who our ancestors were or what our ancestors did. I have an exercise in the book that's about tapping into that because I think it's so key. Um, but for me, um, I really feel my ancestors in a deep way uh, anytime I talk about this work because I do this work for the liberation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, very specifically um, Black and Indigenous women and femmes. Um, And we have been othered and ostracized and oppressed for centuries. I, the the healing work that I have to undertake as a result of um, traumas I've endured in my life, but also traumas I've inherited, you know, through in epigenetics, intergenerational trauma, um, is work that is healing me and also healing my ancestors and my future ancestors. It's deep, deep, deep work. And that's to me what this work is. That's what racial justice work is. It's healing across time and space. Um, and it's necessary. Rachel, early in your book, Do Better, you write that the book was written to white women and for women who are Black, Indigenous people of color. Why did you decide to write the book to white women? Yeah. Um, I really didn't want to write a book to white folks because, you know, whiteness is the status quo and most things are written to or for whiteness and white people, um, whether the author is aware of it or not, irrespective of what racial identity you have. Um, But when I got to the crux of, who needs this work the most, what change needs to be elicited and who needs to um, spearhead that work. 
it was very clear to me that it needed to be white women, specifically cis white women, um, who in my personal and professional experience have caused the most harm and um, many uh, black women and femmes feel similarly. So uh, I felt very strongly that for this work to be done, to actually create justice, to create equity, to result in liberation for all, I had to write it to white women, but it is for black indigenous and people of color because it's for our healing. It's for our well-being. It's so that we don't have to continue to navigate systems of white supremacy and constantly come up against discrimination, oppression, um, and being othered. It's very specifically for, for um, black uh, and girls and femmes. Um, so they don't have to endure very specifically what, what, what I endured, but it's, it's for all of us. When I say that it's two white women and it's for black indigenous women of color, I mean, I prioritize us, our comfort, our well-being, because that's a part of flipping the script of racial justice, because the status quo is to operate in a way that prioritizes the comfort and well-being of whiteness and white folks. Um, but again, when we center those who have been made most marginalized, it supports liberation for all of us. We can only run as fast as the slowest runner. And the slowest runner is the people who have been made most marginalized, and they're only slow at running because there have been systemic and institutional um, obstacles put in their way. And we need to take a bird's eye view, a soul level view of how we are all interconnected and the ways in which it's all of our um, job, especially those who are at the front of the line who have the most power and privilege, to remove those obstacles so that we can all run freely together and actually achieve liberation. Mm -hmm. Now, just to understand something more, when you say white women have caused the most harm, I might have nominated white men as causing mm -hmm. the most harm if mm -hmm. we're going to start nominating possible groups of people. I'm curious what you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't nominate white men because the harm that I have endured from white women is, I find white women actually more resistant to this work than white men. And I find them more resistant to this work, and I talk about this in the book, Broken Record, um, because they uh, are oppressed oppressors. I believe we are all oppressed oppressors, but this very specific identity of oppressed oppressorship that white women occupy, it's actually also quite similar to black men. Um, it's one step down from those who have the most power and privilege, which is white men. So black men just need to be white, they good. White women, just need to be uh, men and they're good. And I don't mean good, I don't mean like white men are fine, but I mean in terms of like ranks of power and privilege. Um, and so it's this um, being so close to uh, having the most power and privilege, but being very, very um, much oppressed by the systems that um, prevent them from doing so. So by patriarchy, heteropatriarchy for white women and um, by anti-blackness, white supremacy and racism for black men. And so where white women often get stuck, and I talk about this in the book, this is where most of us get stuck, but it's, uh, I'll talk about it specifically in the context of white women is um, focusing on the harm that occurs that they have experienced as a result of patriarchy, which is absolutely real and problematic and needs to be addressed. And to me is very much a part of racial justice. I believe that all systems of oppression derive from white supremacy. And when we talk about racial justice, I'm talking about intersectional justice, which includes ending all forms of oppression as they currently exist. Um, so white women are very much oppressed by patriarchy. It's absolutely a problem. And also oppress black indigenous and people of color. And it's that and also that gets very missed, I find, by white women. Um, similarly by black men. Black men are very much oppressed by white supremacy, anti-blackness, racism, and very much oppressed women via patriarchy and misogyny, and that gets missed by them. They're very much focused on the ways in which they are oppressed and not the ways in which they also cause harm. And I find that white women are the most resistant to that understanding, and if you're resistant to that understanding, then you can't fulsomely partake in the work. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to read you a quote from Do Better. It's a strong quote. You ready? Yeah. All right. Rachel writes, all white people are racist, whether you like it or not, or intend to be or not. Simply by belonging to whiteness, 
all white people perpetuate and benefit from the global system of white supremacy on an individual and collective level. And when I read that, I circled it and <laughs> I thought to myself, I need to understand more how all white people are racist. Yeah, so um, all white people are racist in the same way that all men perpetuate patriarchy in the same way that all cisgender folks are transphobic in the same way that all straight folks are homophobic, all non-disabled folks are ableist. Some of these labels, I'm included in the dominant group. It's the status quo way of being. And unless you are actively partaking in um, work day in, day out to counter the status quo, then you are simply benefiting from and perpetuating um, systems of harm, systems of oppression. I think the question is, how are you not perpetuating it and or benefiting from it? How are you not? Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the key, when I heard you, you said these days, unless, unless you're, and I want to understand more about what the unless is, unless mm -hmm. you're doing what specifically? Mm -hmm. So, th so there isn't really an unless, like we, we don't get outside of that. Um, we don't get outside of that, but it's, um, a level of not not uh, trying to undo or remove ourselves from it. This is something that I talk about in the work in the book, and again, I think it's really important in, in terms of the inner work. We're not trying to achieve um, some sense of otherness. We're not trying to achieve perfection. That is not the goal. That is a white supremacist myth. Um, we'll never get there. Uh, nor should that be a standard that we hold ourselves to. And it's something that really stops people a lot of times. They don't think that they're going to get it right. And so they don't do anything at all, which is um, it, which is violent in and of itself, right? Silence is violence. Inaction is an action and a choice. Um, but the work is to acknowledge that, A, I'm not saying that all white people are bad or that all people who belong to dominant groups are bad or wrong or evil, but it's very, very important that we have the acknowledgement that that is the truth, that that is the case. Um, that we acknowledge that wholeheartedly with our entire body and being, um, and then do the work that's required to spend our power and privilege to the extent to which you belong to a dominant identity, to spend your power and privilege, however, whenever possible, to do the inner work that's required in order for you to be able to understand that and um, support yourself in doing that. That's why this work is healing work, it's shadow work. It's trauma work. <laughs> so you're really going to face your shadow when you sit with that. If you belong to a dominant identity and you realize that you have been perpetuating systems of harm as part of the status quo, um, that harm, not only folks who have been made most marginalized, they also harm you. All of these systems harm all of us. Again, differently depending on how much power and privilege you hold and the, the, the oppression form in question that we're discussing. Um, but fulsomely embodying and understanding that and then doing the work that is required to mitigate that harm. It is not to end that harm. We are all humans. We are all interconnected. We all um, impact one another. So we will not get to a place where we stop harm, but to do our best to acknowledge the harm that we have caused and will cause, um, to rectify it in a meaningful, proactive way. Um, and the only real apology is changed behavior. And to do our best to mitigate that harm moving forward. So I have um, a lot of really close white friends and they are white people who acknowledge the power and privilege that they possess as a result of being white. They acknowledge the difference in power and privilege in our relationship. They acknowledge the ways in which um, their anti-blackness and their white supremacy arises, including in our relationship. They understand that they have caused me harm. They do their best to rectify that harm um, and acknowledge it. And they understand that they will continue to cause me harm. And they do their best to mitigate that and to rectify and acknowledge it when it occurs. Could you give me some specific examples when you're talking about your circle of friends and your friendships with white people who, where you feel they're spending their power and privilege in ways that makes you want to stay their friend? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I give a lot of specific examples in the book. Um, for example, I had uh, I have quite a few white friends who will um, who will support me in whatever with whatever gifts or talents are there. So you know, like someone's a UX designer or someone is a um, uh, an author. Um, 
or whatever their specific gift and talent is. And um, they're there for me to call on to contribute as needed um, to support me as a black person, period. And also specifically um, to support me in the work I do as a black person in the quest for uh, racial justice and liberation. Um, that's one example. Another example is um, I've had a dear white friend raise funds for me to um, attend a conference, to, like hosted a fundraiser to raise funds to um, send me to. So I was able to attend a conference. Uh, these are white people who, uh, if and when they see or witness um violence occurring and by that I mean emotional violence so what people most commonly know is microaggressions and I don't call them microaggressions because they're not micro when they when they understand that white supremacy or anti-blackness or misogyny is at play in their presence um they get to work in naming it and calling calling it out um and doing their best to stop that uh not in a savior way, not to save me, but um, because they understand that that's that's their duty and that's the way in which they can spend their power and privilege. Uh, I've also had white friends um, who have made introductions, um, you know, by virtue of being white, they have more access to power and privilege than me as a queer multiracial black woman. And so they help open doors for me and the work that I do. Those are just a few of a lot of examples. Yeah, those are good. Those are good examples. Now, you said you don't like the term microaggressions because mm -hmm. micro makes it seem like it's really, really small, mm -hmm. and these unconscious aggressions or semi-conscious aggressions, or uh, however you would describe them, cause a lot of harm. What do you call them? Um, I call them harrowing or heartbreaking. Ooh, harrowing or heartbreaking acts of racism, formerly known as microaggressions. Um, acronym is HARM, H-A-R-M, because that's what they are. They're harmful. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things you talk about in Do Better are the obstacles that come up for people when they begin an authentic commitment to racial justice work. These obstacles will come up. And the very first one you identify, and there are a couple that I'd like to talk with you about, is this need that the white women who Do Better was written for, <laughs> the need uh, that we, and I'll say we, feel to be good and right, mm -hmm. and that it's very uncomfortable as someone who likes to be a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, being right, I don't know, but being good, yeah, I want to be a good person. It's very uncomfortable to hear uh, all white people are racist, and some mm -hmm. of the other confrontations that you lay out very clearly in the book. So I want to talk about that. When that need comes up, that need to be good, oh my God, uh, that's an obstacle. So what do we do when that comes up? I feel a need to be good. I want to be good. Yeah. I mean, first and foremost is having awareness of it. Like a lot of this book is calling us back into our bodies, into a sense of awareness um, that the status quo has conditioned out of us. You know, I believe that we're all born just these beautiful, wise beings. And then um, we're conditioned out of knowing, out of intuition, um, out of connection, out of community. So first and foremost is the awareness. It's a question that I pose in the book around this question, like, or, yeah, around this, this obstacles, uh, and not being able to acknowledge, like, when I get that defense come up, when I feel that in my body, is there a part of me that's trying to be good or right? And I, I will, um, I, I totally hear you, Tammy, on the like, oh, do I need to, do I have an inclination to being right? Um, you know, a lot of folks would say, I don't know, but getting it right, I would say huge obstacle, that deep need to want to get it right. Um, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to get it wrong because it, it goes against everything you've learned, essentially. Um, and um, it's, it's foreign. This way of operating, this way of being, this way of seeing the world is foreign. So you're going to get it wrong. The expectation is not to get it right all the time. The expectation is not perfection. If that's the expectation, we're setting ourselves up to fail. Perfection is a, a, a lie and a consequence of, of white supremacy. So uh, acknowledging, like, is there something in me that wants to be good? Where is that coming from? Because that is deep healing work. That's not just about racial justice. That's like across the board. What's that about? Um, and doing that with a, a, a really deep sense of wise compassion for ourselves, because 
we were all born into systems of oppression. We have all been conditioned from young, as have our parents and our parents' parents and our parents' parents, which is, again, why I think it's important for us to talk about our ancestors and our ancestry. Um, and so to unplug from the matrix, as I, t I call it, and that's what this work is, it's going against the status quo. Um, very challenging. Everything in our society is telling us to, to be good and right, and, and at least to be perceived as good and right. Um, so it's not, it's not easy. So what are the ways in which I can unplug from that and have a deeper understanding and awareness of like, where does that actually come from? What is that about? Why do I feel this deep need to be good and um, to get it right? And what work do I need to do around that? And what are the culturally informed, culturally appreciative practices that I can take on that will support me in this deep, deep shadow work? Because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. help, help me understand how this need to get it right, this need for perfection or drive for perfection is an expression of white supremacy. Sure. It's like a, uh, so to me, capitalism is part and part of white supremacy because it's all about power and privilege. And it's about um, ensuring that, you know, a select few can have power and privilege to the detriment and exclusion of other people. And a quest for perfection is to me also an offshoot of capitalism and productivity. If we're constantly being expected um, to produce and to produce things without error, it's uh, a lie and a distraction that keeps us constantly busy and striving to do something that's impossible, um, that takes us away from doing uh, deep healing work, really, from being connected with one another. It keeps us shamed. It keeps us stuck. If you're striving for perfection all the time, that's like a full-time job. And, and a lot of us have been conditioned in that way. Um, a lot of women, cis women have been specifically, I'd say have been conditioned in that way um, as a means to, um, to come up against the oppression that we face from patriarchy. Like we are oppressed by patriarchy. And so a lot of us feel like we need to excel. We have to work harder um, than men or masculine folks. And so there's more of a desire to be perfect. So case in point, um, I talk about this in the book and forgive me because I can't remember it exactly in this moment, but um, and some of the listeners may have already heard about this, but, you know, they say um, women and femmes will apply for a job if we have 100% of the qualifications and men right. and masculine people will apply with 60% of the qualifications. That's a byproduct of their male masculine privilege that they feel that sense of entitlement to be able to do that. And it's a result of our oppression as a result of patriarchy that women and femmes um, feel like we, can, we can't apply unless we have 100%. That, that's white supremacy, that's oppression, that is perfectionism uh, at play. Okay, so I'm gonna go even further into this need uh, to be good and right and the discomfort that comes up when we realize uh, not only are we gonna get it wrong, but that as a white person, I'm inherently racist and have been swimming in the, in the water of white supremacy my whole life. And you take the term white fragility, this notion that Robin DeAngelo introduced that white people can kind of cave inside. We're you know, so fragile that we can't handle these conversations and this confrontation. And you introduce a different kind of language. You call it white wildness. And I, I want to understand more about the term you're introducing, white wildness. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think it's harmful to call it fragility because that takes a, some of the harm out of it. It feels passive in a way, like, oh, I'm just a bit fragile <laughs> um, and that can't be helped. Or um, it implies to me that that fragility doesn't cause serious emotional, physical, spiritual, mental harm. And it does. Um, and I call it white wildness because for those of us who are entrenched in this work, oftentimes when these things happen, we're just like, it's wild. Like that response, there's no other word for it. It's just absolutely wild. Um, the ways in which we see people just entrenched in the status quo, entrenched in their power and privilege and refusing, like doing whatever necessary um, to, to negate anything that comes up against that. Um, so it, it's um, not only fragility, it's ferociousness. Um, 
And um, it frequently arises in regards to a conversation around race or racism with white people. And it's a form of emotional violence. It's absolutely um, harmful, if not just straight up traumatizing to be um, a black indigenous or person of color, I speak about myself personally, to be a queer multiracial black woman constantly having to navigate that from white people. It's, it's, um, it's traumatizing. Mm-hmm. A couple times you've mentioned this notion of people taking responsibility to do their shadow work. And in the book, Do Better, you linked as part of our shadow work, also being willing to do wounded inner child work. Mm. And I wanted to hear more about that, how you think working out the issues we have with our wounded inner child, all of us have some issues to work out in that regard, I think, uh, how that relates to racial justice work. Yeah. Um, So I talk about racial justice work being shadow work because it brings up so many parts of ourselves that we have been conditioned to suppress. It brings up um, often guilt, grief, anger, deep, deep, deep sadness. And again, some of this is ours and some of it is also ancestral. Some of it is inherited. Um, And I go into this in depth in the book, but not only inherited as a result of being subjected to oppression, but also inherited as being an oppressor, like the ways in which you have to disconnect your self from your highest self, from your body, um, from others in order to oppress other people, whether it's subconscious or not, is deeply traumatizing to experience and endure. Um, So the shadow work is bringing that stuff to light. It's bringing to light um, those pieces of ourselves Um, that we often are conditioned to hide, to defend, to ignore, um, and unearthing them so that we can really have an understanding of what those are and why they're there. So that's, you know, carte blanche shadow work. And then for me, shadow work very much includes um, acknowledging and addressing our wounded inner child. And I'm with you, Tammy, I agree. We all have some semblance of a wounded inner child. None of us were loved perfectly as children, no matter how amazing our parents were. We all endured um, some form of harm. And as little beings, we couldn't make sense of it. And so a lot of us internalized whatever that harm was as um, being something wrong or bad about us. Um, and that can really, that can really run our show um, for most, if not all, of our lives if we don't do some inner work to bring that to the surface. Um, and so I think our um, inner child at times can be like this little energetic being that is having a tam- a tantrum inside um, because they're not getting their needs met or because you know they've endured some. Um, some slight, some sort of harm, and they don't feel tended to or properly cared for. And if we can't take the time to be with that um, and to address it, then it can come out in all sorts of ways in our adult lives um, without us having an understanding of like what's really happening. So one of the first exercises in the book is connecting with our inner child so that we can Um, bring our inner child along with us in this work and so that we can um, start tending to our inner garden and really giving ourselves what we need. Uh, I'm wondering if you could give me a specific example, maybe from people you've worked with or where somehow tending to this inner child, the aspect of our shadow has changed someone's capacity to do the work of unplugging from the matrix, to use your language of white supremacy. Like, oh, once they did this piece of healing, they had a new set of capacities. Sure, I would say I see this, uh, personally I've experienced this and see this a lot uh, in my work um, with all different kinds of people. Um, But when we have more tolerance to withstand the full spectrum of our human emotions, then we have more tolerance um, for others. When we have more tolerance to fulsomely 
be with and understand and acknowledge what's going on for us, then we have more tolerance across the board for ourselves. We have more compassion for ourselves and cultivating all of that um, results in us also having more tolerance and um, compassion for others, especially those who we have harmed, um, especially those who have been made most marginalized by systems of oppression that we may belong to and perpetuate. Um, and if we are unable to do that, then th that's the flip side. Then we're constricted in being able to show up for ourselves and then we're unable to show up for others. So um, for me, my when I tune in and tap into my inner child, um, uh, which is active work I'm doing in a really ongoing way, right? I, I absolutely practice what I preach. Otherwise I'd be a hypocrite. Um, and and for me, my inner child felt very um, othered, as I mentioned, from multiple experiences, um, not just out in the world, but also as a result of like family dynamics, you know, uh, uh, in many forms. And so um, my work is really tending to her, having an understanding of like um, the ways in which she feels scared or um, uncared for, unloved, unworthy, unaffirmed. Um, and doing my inner work to show up for her, to help her feel aff affirmed and understood. Um, right now I'm doing um, a 40-day um, um, masterclass, I'll call it, around uh, inner anger. And um, I do a Kriya every day to support and unearthing my inner anger and then getting to the bottom of that, which is really sadness. And to me, that's really inner child work. And my inner child like, has been coming up so much in all of my dreams, you know, and she's, she's like, I'm angry. I'm angry at the way that I was treated. I'm angry at the ways that I, I, I don't feel like I got what I needed. You know, I don't feel like I got what I needed. I was just a little kid and I didn't, I didn't get mostly emotional, uh, didn't have my emotional needs met. And, um, and so I'm, I'm listening to her and I am doing my best as adult Rachel to give her what she needs now. And all of that work really helps me open up my heart, my vulnerability, my ability to have capacity for myself to be embodied in myself. Um, and that supports me in doing the work that I do in having capacity for others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that example. It was uh, it really illuminated it for me. So thank you. Now, one other thing I'd like to talk to you about, uh, Rachel, before we bring our conversation to a close, as someone who runs a company of approximately 130 people, that uh, sounds true. I know that part of your racial justice work involves working with businesses and large brands on anti-racism initiatives, uh, including working with Lululemon and Google. And I'd love to know from your vantage point, what the real litmus test is for an organization. Are they engaging in performative activism or real activism? Mm. This is a tricky one. Um, and I've actually been doing less and less work <laughs> less and less organizational work because I think so few organizations are really fulsomely doing this work in a meaningful way. Um, yeah. And part of that is because again, all systems of oppression are, are tied for me to do the work of anti-racism, racial justice, dismantling white supremacy requires a fulsome intersectional look at um systems of oppression and harm. And a lot of, I mean, business corporations operate under, I mean, we all operate under a capitalist model, but of course businesses are closer to that, to that dynamic than anyone. And so um, I just find uh, in my experiences, it's been incredibly challenging um, to find businesses who are willing to do the amount of work that is required um, in the quest for justice, uh, which is which is hard and heartbreaking. Um, but um, I think first and foremost, the work has to be done internally, uh, personally, as well. And so, a lot of the work that I will do with businesses now is just is just the work that I do with individuals because um, we are all humans. We're all in human 
bodies and we all show up at work with our personal uh, identities and perspectives. Um, and in order for an organization to change, it requires a large enough collective shift of individual minds. Um, of course, most notably from the uh, folks who own and run those organizations, but that can't be it. Um, we need we need everyone on board. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely... <laughs> Um, a challenge and an ongoing one for the folks involved who are who are who are trying. But I think where I'm at specifically, as well as it's 2021, we're in the middle of a, a global pandemic, and I say still say in the middle because I do believe we're still very much in the middle. Um, we came out of um, the most recent iteration of Black uprisings in the midst of that pandemic, um, and the only real shift that I saw. Uh, in 2020 around race and racial justice was was because capitalism slowed to such a halt that people didn't have the distractions, specifically people who have the most power and privilege, didn't have the same level of distractions as they were used to having. And so it forced them to be to pay attention in a way they refused to previously. Um, although many of those people have stopped paying attention already, unfortunately. Uh, although I suppose the storm on the Capitol, you know, again, brought folks' attention back to this issue that never goes away and constantly needs to be worked on. It's constant work. It's constant work and it requires so much, but we're in the year 2021. I am saying nothing new. I am saying the same stuff that my ancestors were saying for hundreds and hundreds of years. These systems of inequity, these systems of oppression and, unjust and injustice have been ongoing for centuries. And so the level with which I think the shifts that are required from individuals who have the most power and privilege and from business um, needs to be a lot higher <laughs> than what we're currently seeking. So I hope that that will shift. I couldn't do this work if I wasn't hopeful. Um, I don't have any quick quips about what it looks like to do this work in an authentic way as a business, as opposed to performative allyship, except that that it's work that needs to be done every single day from the inside out. Um, and all the shifts will come from that. So let's say someone's listening to our conversation, uh, Rachel, and they're, what's going through their mind is, you know, I'm inspired to be a genuine ally. And one of the things I just want to point out is that you're very clear and do better that for you, ally is not a word that you like using as a noun, but you like to talk more about acting in allyship. And we can talk about uh, why you make that distinction, but someone's listening and they want to act in allyship very genuinely. And you're talking about this inner work and maybe they have a sense of it. You talked about actually working with our thoughts every day, oppressive thoughts. If you had to summarize, here are the key things, oh person, you want to work and act in allyship. Let me tell it to you straight. I mean, I don't have key things. <laughs> it's, 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 um, and that's part of the work because people just want that soundbite and there isn't one and they want um, steps that they can utilize that will work carte blanche and that doesn't exist. It's, it's dynamic. It's ever changing. It's ongoing. Every single day you will constantly be learning and relearning and unlearning. I am. Um, and fucking up and needing to do better every second of every day. That's the work. And it's also why so many people don't want to do the work <laughs> because it's endless and it's not quick and easy. Um, I would say most importantly, if you want to act in allyship, you belong to a dominant group. You need to have a deep understanding of the ways in which you perpetuate harm every single day. And the extent to which you refuse to acknowledge that and mitigate that harm means that you're perpetuating the problem, period. I appreciate, uh, Rachel, you bringing the dynamic complexity to some of the questions I asked you here at the end, both about business and about that person who wants to act in allyship. I really appreciate that. I'm not necessarily in this program, Insights at the Edge, looking for easy answers. I'm looking for authentic and truthful answers. And so I really just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. I've been talking to Rachel Ricketts, racial justice educator, healer, speaker, and the author of the new book, Do Better, Spiritual Activism for Fighting and Healing white supremacy. And I learned a lot and am reflecting on quite a lot in this book, Do Better. I highly recommend it. Rachel, thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at soundstrue.com forward slash podcast. And if you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And also, if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I love getting your feedback, being in connection with you, and learning how we can continue to evolve and improve our program. Working together, I believe, we can create a kinder and wiser world. Soundstrue.com. Waking up the world.